Hello and a very warm welcome to DBS Treasures Annual Wealth Summit Delhi chapter powered by CNBCTV18.com. I'm your host Mukda Kaldra and it's a pleasure to see you all this evening. Together we embark today on a journey to explore the dynamic landscape of wealth management, an industry undergoing profound transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, the wealth management landscape in India finds itself at a pivotal juncture, facing a convergence of uh, disruptive forces reshaping its very foundations. We observe a significant wealth transfer from older generations to a much younger tech-savvy cohort, accompanied by a surge in demand for innovative digital solutions, which are also hyper-personalized in these days. At the same time, new players are emerging, challenging the status quo, challenging uh, the very fabric of how the industry works, and pushing traditional wealth managers to now change, adapt, and evolve. The market landscape is shifting, and uh, incumbents must act now swiftly to safeguard their position and stay ahead of the curve. This confluence of factors present both challenges and opportunities for wealth management professionals everywhere. How can they leverage technology to enhance client experiences? What are the strategies that will enable them to navigate through this era of disruption while safeguarding and growing their client database and wealth? These are the critical questions that we are asking and we will be exploring in depth today through our event. So let's dive in and uncover the secrets to thriving in the new era of wealth management. Without further ado, may I first please invite on stage Mr. Prashant Joshi, Managing Director and Head Consumer Banking Group, DBS Bank, to deliver the welcome note address, sir. Good evening, everyone, uh, for coming here for the second leg of the DBS Treasures Wealth Summit, the inaugural Wealth Summit, which we have started with in this year. Last week, we had this in Mumbai, and just as in Mumbai, I see a fabulous crowd uh, uh, here as well. So very warm welcome. Uh, thank you for coming here and gracing this uh, uh, occasion. When we were planning this event, a lot of people said that there couldn't have been a better time uh, for this event. You know, because markets are at uh, lifetime high. Uh, you know, genuinely, wealth is getting created, not just what used to be the preserve of old metros, uh, but in the tier two and tier three cities. Uh, but in, in our view at DBS, actually there, any time was as good as having this uh, summit. You know, for two reasons. One is that, you know, we don't look at wealth and wealth management uh, as a market-linked phenomena. Wealth it needs to get created, preserved, and grown, you know, over generations, passed on over generations, and economies grow and prosper and generate the wealth. So it's not something which is, which wealth management is not a topic when, which you don't discuss when markets are down and discuss only when markets are up. Uh, so clearly, as I said, any time could be as good as this time, and I'm glad that we are uh, doing it here. DBS has been in the country for over 30 years. And you know, now we have two and a half million customers you know, across 349 cities and in all kinds of tier through tier two and tier three cities as well. We are engaged in corporate banking, SME banking, uh, consumer banking, and wealth management, which is a part of the consumer banking, is something that's been growing very, very fast over the past several years for us, just as the entire industry uh, is also growing. And therefore, what becomes important, not just in the context of wealth management, in the context of the bank also, is the heritage that we have got you know, from Singapore. Uh, and we, we take a lot of pride in that and build on that uh, in India as well. In wealth management, we offer treasures uh, proposition, uh, which is in India, equal treasures private client proposition. And in Singapore, of course, we have the DBS private bank, and I know some of you are customers of the DBS Private Bank who are present here. Thank you for being here. And equally, the family offices, you know, which has become a, a big 
source of wealth management over the past uh, five, 10 years. In fact, in Singapore, we have close to one third share of the family office uh, uh, business as well. But the, as I said, markets will be up, markets may be down, wealth management trends may keep changing. And we do hope that through this event, we are able to capture some of these trends and establish thought leadership in the area of wealth management. However, something that will never change in wealth management is the basic element of trust. The trust that clients have in the institution, and that trust gets built and derived on the basis of two fundamental principles. One is competence, and the second, even more important, integrity. So competence and integrity will build trust, and which is what eventually customers will look forward to and look for. With that, again, I welcome you to the uh, event, and I look forward to engaging discussions with uh, all of you. Thank you for coming again. Uh, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant, for setting the tone for the event. Ladies and gentlemen, let's move on. In an era of dynamic global markets and evolving economics, uh, economics uh, paradigms, uh, economic paradigms and economy the way it is, India stands at the forefront as a beacon of unparalleled potential and promise. And as we gather and, and uh, embark on this journey together to explore the myriad uh, avenues and strategies that can unlock the vast treasure trove of opportunities within India's thriving financial ecosystem, from burgeoning sectors to innovative uh, investment vehicles, our discussions today are going to delve deep into the intricacies of navigating this vibrant landscape and harnessing its full potential for profitable returns and sustainable growth. Our upcoming keynote address titled Unlocking India's Financial Investment Opportunity shall try and unravel the tapestry of India's financial future and chart a course towards prosperity and success. And for that, let me take this opportunity to invite on stage Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal, Member Economic Advisory Council of the Prime Minister and Secretary to Government of India. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for allowing, giving me this opportunity today to speak to all of you. This is, of course, a particularly exciting time to be Indian and be in India. Um, <clears throat> this is, and I hope at the end of my talk I will have convinced you, this is not just a turning point in Indian history, it's a turning point in world history. And you have to think in really long horizons uh, of time and able to appreciate the kind of shift that we are uh, already undergoing and will see in the next uh, decade or two. Now all of you are aware that India is currently the fastest growing economy in the world. We will be this year uh, hitting a GDP of about four trillion dollars. If you had asked me till last year how that would pan out over the next few years, I would have said that at some point in time in 25, we would become the world's fourth largest economy, and some point in 26, 27, we would become the world's third largest economy. But as things are panning out, with the sharp drop in the yen, um, Japan's economy is now just above $4 trillion right now which means that you know, our economy will actually bypass uh, Japan's within the next 12 months. Unless, of course, uh, the exchange rate goes ori again. I mean, one shouldn't trust exchange rates, but I'm just telling you the yen movement in for this particular purpose has certainly played to this uh, ranking. And Germany's economy is not too far off. It's at about 4.5, 4.6 trillion dollars. So you're looking at maybe 18 months, maximum 24 months from now, when India will become the world's third largest economy. So despite all the uh, sort of hits we took from COVID and so on, uh, we are not too far off from 
the trajectory we had laid out when we talked about a $5 trillion economy. We should be there in about 20, 27, 28, thereabouts. But we will ironically, in terms of ranking, have been able to hit it uh, ahead of schedule. Because as I said, growth in the world's fourth and fifth largest economies are basically, uh, sorry, third and fourth largest economies are basically stalled, and the exchange rates are moving in our favor. Now, all of that is great, but in fact, we shouldn't see India's rise in terms of even this, whether it's annual growth rates or quarterly growth rates or even the election cycles and so on. What you are seeing is truly historic if you take a longer term perspective. And given the vagaries of exchange rates, we need to think about this in purchasing power parity terms. So let me tell you what is going on. So I've got here with me the long range estimates from a, a very famous study by Angus Madison about how in the very long run, our position in the world has changed. Now, you may have already heard that two centuries ago, in 1820, India and China together accounted for, the, for half of the world economy. Now that is a bit misleading because at that time, China had already begun to dominate the economy. In, in fact, at that point in time, in 1820, China accounted for 33% of the world economy and we accounted for uh, something in the range of 16%. So in fact, China was already doing the heavy lifting two centuries ago. So to understand what is going on, you need to go back and take a much longer horizon of things. So let's start 2,000 years ago. Okay? In the year zero, or 1 AD, India's economy accounted for 33% of the world's economy. It was one third of the world's economy. At that stage, China's economy was the second largest economy at 26%. And just to put it in context, all of Western Europe together accounted for 11%. So we were three times the size of all of Western Europe put together. Now for the next thousand years, we remained comfortably the world's largest economy. So by about a thousand years ago, 1000 AD, we were 29% of the world economy. So our share had come down just a dot. China's economy, oddly, had come down even sharper to about 23%. Then the next 500 odd years, our share dropped. As many of you are aware, we were invaded repeatedly. Uh, the Turkic invasions and so on caused a great deal of disruption to our economy. So our share of the world economy dropped to about 24.5%. By this time, China's economy had popped up to 25%. So China became the world's largest economy and bypassed India about 500 years ago. At this time, Europe was going through the Renaissance. So it went through a big shift in its share of the world economy. And it was about 18% of the world economy around about the year 1500. Still smaller than us, still smaller than China, but clearly sharp increase. So this is the time, remember, that the Europeans were exploring the world. They had discovered the new, <coughs> the, <coughs> the Americas and so on. Vasco da Gama had already found his way to India. Now, over the next few centuries, Europe's share dramatically went up. So by 1820, when the Industrial Revolution was taking off, Western Europe's share had grown up to 24% of the world economy. But let me tell you, even at this stage, China was a world leader. So in the year 1820, China's share of the world economy was 33%. And India's share by this point, because remember, we had already been colonized by this point for some time, had gone down by this point to 16%. Now, the 19th century was quite catastrophic. 
for both India and China. So by 1913, i.e. just before the First World War was about to happen, India's share had dropped further to just 7.6%. So India's share a century earlier was <coughs> about 16%. By 1913, it was less than half at 7.8%. But something even more catastrophic happened to China. It had gone from 33% to just 9%. So it was slightly bigger than India's economy, but it was a really catastrophic drop. So although we Indians tend to focus on what happened to us in the 19th century, the famines, the colonization, and so on, but the Opium Wars, the various revolutions, was absolutely catastrophic for China. And the meanwhile, Europe's share jumped up to being a third of the world economy. So this was the peak of European domination over the world, when just before the, second, before the First World War, Europe accounted for a third of the world's economy. From here, things changed dramatically. America took off, and by 1950, by which time both India and China had become new republics, Europe's share had dropped to 26%. However, by this time, both India and China had been really squeezed out. China's share by the time 1950 came around, was just 4.5%. And we had become independent, and our share had gone down to 4.2%. So you can see how catastrophic this decline was. However, if you thought becoming free was a good thing, let me tell you policies that both these countries adopted after becoming independent free countries was just as catastrophic. So, by 1980, and here I'm now shifting from Angus Madison's estimates to IMF estimates, because <clears throat> they are a little more accurate. They're not exactly the same, but they are still PPP IMF estimates. So, in 1980, China's share had gone down to just 2.3% of the world economy. It had gone through the Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, and they had been catastrophic. So this is about the time that it began to reform its economy from 1978 onwards. Its share of the world economy had gone down to just 2.3%. And Nehruvian socialism had taken us down to 3%. So we had fared a little bit better. So Nehru's policies were a little bit better than Mao's. So we had gone down to 3%. China was down to 2.3%. So I'm just pointing out to you how catastrophic this decline was with colonization, but just pointing out to you that bad policies, even if you're a free country, can also be pretty catastrophic. Now from the 80s onward, some tentative reforms began to happen in India. China took it a little more seriously. And by 1991, when we began to open up our economy, China's share had already gone up to 4%. Ours had drifted up a little bit to about 3.5% through the 80s. Remember, the 80s had seen some reforms. We had let in Maruti, for example. Many of you in the audience will remember the Maruti 800. By 2000, China had taken off. So by 2000, China's share of the world economy was already at 7.2%. We had improved a little bit, and it had gone up to 4.3%. And today, in 2024, China is 19.5% of the world economy. Still not to where it was in 1820, but now, in PPP terms, already the world's largest economy. Okay? India has done reasonably well, not as well as China, but we are now accounting in 2024 for 8% of the world's economy. Okay? Now just, just let me tell you 
This 8% just brings us back to where we were a hundred years ago, and just before the First World War. So we have just about, over the course of a century, clawed, clawed back. So the course of a century, we went back through the last 30, 40 years of uh, colonization, and then 40 years of socialism, and then 30 years of reforms, that cycle has just brought us back to where we were in terms of our share in world economy, to where we were just before the First World War. So we are here at a threshold of something. We are not there yet. This is an opportunity because at least the IMF's estimates, and this roughly is my own judgment, that China's share in the world economy will now plateau out at about 19 odd percent. Our share will be now beginning to grow. By 2027 or thereabouts, we will be the single largest contributor of world growth unless something goes badly wrong. And so by 2030, we should be at about a little over 9% of the world economy. And from there, as you know, compounding is one of the most powerful tools in the world, we will begin to claw back more and more of our true place in the world economy. Now, what is our true place in the world economy? Well, we happen to be one-sixth of the world population. So, our true share of the world economy should be about one-sixth. That is what we should minimally aspire for over the next 20, 25 years. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be a journey where we hope to dramatically improve the quality of lives for something where we will peak at slightly short of 1.6 billion people in 20, 25 years' time. And hopefully by that time, we will have solved for extreme poverty. Well, before that, hopefully, we will have clawed back our place in the world and that by that time, by the way, we will also be the world's largest economy. That is the aim when we are in 2047 celebrating a hundred years of being a free country. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very enlightening session and talking about our true place and our true share in the world economy and, of course, our dream of being one of the largest economies. Very well spoken, sir. Thank you so much. Moving on, ladies and gentlemen. Now, uh, well, talking about India's landscape of wealth management, uh, which is undergoing a metamorphosis, driven by an interplay of technological advancements, uh, shifting demographics, as I mentioned before, and evolving client expectations. So gone are the days of traditional wealth management paradigms and practices. Instead, we find ourselves today at the forefront of a revolution where innovation and adaptability and agility are the keys to success. Now, in the upcoming panel discussion titled the changing face of wealth management and its gateway to success, we will deep dive into the heart of this transformation. From the rise of digital platforms to the emergence of new age wealth management professionals and models, our esteemed panelists will illuminate the shifting contours of India's wealth management landscape and also explore some of the strategies and insights essential for navigating this ever evolving and changing terrain. So without further ado, let's ignite this conversation. But first, uh, first off, may I invite the moderator of the session on stage, CNBC TV 18's senior editor, Surabhi Upadhyay. Surabhi is right here. And joining her on her panel, um, our, our esteemed guests, uh, Ashish Taneja, founding partner, GrowX Ventures, and uh, Rich Atripathi, head wealth management products at DBS Treasures. Welcome.
Good evening, Delhi, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, always great to be in the city for me. For me, it's home city, so when it's work combined with coming back home, uh, it could never get better, right? I uh, really appreciate all of you being here this evening and uh, taking out the time to join us in these really important and very, very interesting conversations. We, of course, had our first chapter in Mumbai. Rich and I were in conversation there as well, and we're glad to be here with you in Delhi today. Uh, Ashish, welcome to the conversation as well. So the, the topic at hand that we have is, uh, you know, is a very interesting one, the changing face of wealth management in India and its gateway to success. Uh, the definition and the paradigm of wealth and the wealth effect is changing for sure. We see that around us and we, we're seeing that across strata from the mass affluent going up to the HNI to the ultra HNI. Uh, I think it's pretty established that India indeed has emerged as a huge land of opportunity when it comes to wealth creation. So I want to you know, kickstart by getting your thoughts, both of you, on where we stand right now. Uh, the economic landscape and what that means in terms of uh, just the wealth opportunity. Richa? Yeah, so thanks, thanks, Urvi, and thanks, uh, CNBC, for uh, pulling this off. Um, in the Mumbai chapter was outstanding, and uh, we heard some great speakers, and I'm hoping that today uh, we'll, we'll also, like, you know, get to hear a lot of good stuff. Uh, having said that, we've heard Sanjeev, so I don't have to really uh, repeat in terms of the growth opportunity that India has, and... Uh, and really, like you know, uh, by uh, by uh, twenty, uh, you know, by this year, we, I mean, this this century, we should be able to see that uh, uh, we are uh, becoming the world's, uh, uh, you know, best, uh, you know, in terms of GDP growth economy. Having said that, uh, we are not really too far from uh, being at least a third in near future. In five to ten years, is what I see. Uh, next 10 years, it's definitely going to be a golden period for Indian, uh, uh, op Indian growth and Indian op opportunity. As far as wealth is concerned, uh, I'll just give some statistics, right? I mean, uh, we heard Prashant saying that, uh, you know, markets are all-time high. Uh, in terms of the wealth affluence segment, uh, it's growing at the rate of 15 to 18% uh, uh, with that Kager, and we expect that to continue over the next 5 to 10 years. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, billionaires are concerned, uh, there was this recent uh, report uh, by Knight Frank, uh, which said that uh, Mumbai has actually surpassed uh, Beijing in terms of number of billionaires that we have in the country. So, of course, the wealth is growing in country, and there is this shift from uh, affluent to ultra HNIs, uh, HNIs and ultra HNIs, uh, which is which we are seeing, and the number is kind of compounding as we speak, right? So there's enough and more for all of us and all of us related to this industry uh, to uh, to gain and gain the market share as far as wealth is concerned. So that's what is a very positive uh, story, and that we all have to kind of you know uh, get our maximum share out of it. Yeah. Absolutely, uh, Ashish, your perspective, because uh, you know at GrowX, you guys are investing in a lot of companies that could be leading to a huge amount of wealth as well. So your perspective on this? Well, so, you know, I'll skip the macros. Yeah, but, you know, I'll, I'll share a piece. Uh, you know, I run a venture capital firm. We're always raising capital. And, uh, you know, over the last decade, uh, I've seen a, you know, step change in approach of uh, foreign investors, individual investors, right? There was a time when, uh, you know, you go and pitch to investors and, uh, you know, the message was, I am not doing India again, I-N-D-I-A. That means they had invested in the country, they'd burned their fingers, no returns came out, right? Today, the situation we'll be sitting in, you know, India is not a question anymore. What people want to do is, where do I start? Where do I invest? Who are the right fund managers? You know, so that's a huge shift, right? You know, we no longer, you know, a plan C or a plan D or a plan E, you know, for a lot of the large institutional funds, you know, we're sitting as your top priority, you know, from them to kind of allocate uh, capital around that, yeah? So that's one big perspective. My business, you know, what I do is, and I hope, you know, we'll be able to, like, folks like us will be able to do more, is essentially to back entrepreneurs. A lot of these entrepreneurs are the future billionaires, yeah? And through those billionaires, you know, a lot of millionaires will get created. And, you know, that's our North Star. If we're able to find uh, the right talent to back, you know, put in our small capital behind them, you know, get some great ideas uh, being shaped out of the country. And through that, you know, if uh, a lot of wealth gets unlocked and gets distributed, uh, you know, through consumption in the country, nothing like it. You know, so that's, that's the big uh, uh, part. 
So uh, the funding winter is over? Is it spring? Is it summer? Or where, where are we? <laughs> you know, I don't know. You know, personally, I, I, I stay away from macros. So, you know, yes, there are talks about uh, trillions of dollars will get uh, 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 added to our GDP, but uh, 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 it does not matter. You know, in a down market, in a good market, the job for us and job for any other wealth manager is to find the right opportunity. You know, it's a needle in the haystack sort of a story, you know, and there are always rock stars out there uh, uh, who are building something good. You know, a lot of people have said that in down markets, great businesses get built, right? So, you know, there's an opportunity. In India, honestly, you know, the winter which we're talking about, it wasn't that harsh. Right? You know, it wasn't that harsh. You know, yes, the sentiment changes, people are slightly more cautious, but uh, good founders are raising capital. Uh, you know, a lot is going behind public markets and, uh, and so on and so forth, right? It wasn't that harsh. I don't know if it's winter, spring, summer, whatever it is, but these are good times. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. Richard, so from, you know, um, the HNI and Ultra HNI perspective, which is obviously sort of a, a big target area for DBS Treasures, uh, how do you look at alternates and basically private markets and how do you handhold investors into venturing into that space in the right way? Yeah, so, uh, so, so Ruby, uh, before I get into that, uh, uh, let me just give you a bit of a perspective of our uh, uh, DBS uh, heritage, right? Uh, we, uh, as Prashant mentioned in the earlier part, uh, that you know we've been in the country for the last 30 years, and uh, uh, we were the first uh, bank, one of the first banks to introduce like completely digital account opening journey, right, which we call as DG Bank. We were, we were the first few. Uh, from there, like, you know, if you look at it, uh, we've been kind of uh, investing a lot on our technology platforms. Uh, we talk about DG platform, uh, DG portfolio, which is a curated basket of you know mutual funds. Basis the you know clients' credit risk. Uh, clients can actually like you know go and uh, invest in that, which is backed by Crisil and Morningstar uh, rated funds. So there is a lot of innovation backed by technology and platform, which is which is going at the back of you know what we do in terms of uh, wealth management and helping our clients to invest better. Uh, as far as, and we cater to across the whole segment or whole uh, spectrum of customers, right? So right from retail to uh, mass affluent to affluent to H&I, ultra H&I, family of offices, it completely kind of, you know, could be cover the whole spectrum from a simple need of SIP investments to family offices to H&Is, ultra H&Is, PMS, alternates, and, and everything is what, like, you know, we, we capture. There is an element of, uh, of and I won't say really a digital or, uh, you know, digital, you know, all those words. But having said that, when we look at the ultra h &I space, uh, relationship management becomes very critical, right? Uh, what is the customer really looking for? A customer is looking for, uh, you know, clearly like t three things which come to my mind. One is convenience. Right? How can we, what convenience are we giving to our customers, whether it's given by the physical RM covering the customer or the digital platform. Second is in terms of transparency, and that's where the trust element comes into play. How transparent are we as a bank or as a service provider? We provide all information to our clients, whether it is like, you know, at, uh, the market's insights or the portfolio that you know, the clients have invested in. It's doing good, bad, what are the terms and conditions, exit entry loads. There are a lot of things, a lot of things that, you know, as a relationship manager, as a wealth, uh, you know, service provider, we need to be sure of and we need to be very transparent about and that brings in this whole element of trust right uh, so coming back to your question now that uh, what are the ways that you know we handle uh, we are a distributor right we have a distribution license what we do is you know through our very rigorous due diligence uh, process we uh, we onboard funds we onboard AMCs and uh, and we look at the credibility of the AMCs cre credibility of the fund houses cre credibility of the fund manager before we even go and talk about and refer it to our clients uh, for them to decide where they want to invest. So that's what is our strategy around uh, uh, addressing or catering to the high uh, net worth individuals. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, transparency and having that aspect of credibility, I yeah. guess, is right up there in terms of uh, key requirements that a client would have. Uh, I want to spend some time talking about uh, now technology, both in terms of what that's doing to the wealth management landscape and Technology as an investment opportunity where your input, Sashi, should be really welcome. So let's uh, discuss the latter first because, you know, AI is the buzzword. Everybody, including I think my 10-year-old niece, knows how much money people are making on the NVIDIA stock. 
And I mean, whether and across the spectrum, I'm sure whether it's massive fluent, going right up to family office level, everybody wants a piece of the pie. What's your advice to people? And you know, what kind of investors are you seeing coming in uh, to your funds? Uh, all kind of investors, you know, all kind of investors. You know, we've got uh, family offices, we've got individual investors, we've got institutional investors, we've got, uh, uh, you know, young entrepreneurs, you know, all kind of investors, right? And, you know, the, we're, a, we're a very small fund, which essentially means, you know, we're kind of dealing with 50, 80, 100 investors at a point of time, right? So, you know, yes, we open up to a few hundred, but it's not the full market, right? But throughout, if you kind of analyze this, these are... Uh, people who are well read, you know, they understand as to how technology is going to shift the world. Uh, uh, and uh, they use uh, the new IP innovative stuff day in and day out in their work or personal lives and so on and so forth. So they're exposed to that. There's another category who wants to participate in new IP coming out of uh, this country, right? You know, if you kind of look back our landscape, right? I mean, we started seeing success when the IT services, uh, you know, likes of Infosys, Wipro, TCS kind of came into being, right? But, uh, you know, the hundreds of thousands of the people who work with these large, large IT services companies, they've opened up the next level of entrepreneurship, for, right? They are, hardcore engineers, seriously talented people who've kind of delivered these products for large companies in the past, now they're gonna go back and saying we're gonna do it for ourselves, right? In India today, in our portfolio, you know, we've got a young team, actually two, in space technology, right? One of them is building a constellation of nanosatellites, yeah? The other, other one is building propulsion engines for in-orbit navigation, yeah? We've got a, we've got a team solving for uh, you know, data communication using light. We've got a team uh, uh, giving vision to robotics, right? And these are the kind of qualities of ideas which are coming up and, you know, entrepreneurs are chasing those dreams. So a lot of the HNIs are, want to participate in these growth journeys and, you know, say that I own a piece of uh, the next yeah, uh, Tesla or SpaceX. And just, yeah. just to add to what, uh, you know, Ashish mentioned, uh, uh, in addition to, you know, what's happening outside in the outside in, in the whole, like, you know, as, as, as a country that, you know, there's a lot of tectonic shift towards technology that we have seen in the last 10 years. Uh, you know, from the bank point of view, uh, internally, the way we use and leverage technology um, in, in terms of helping our clients to, to take right decisions, right? So it's backed by a lot of data, a lot of data analytics. Uh, you know, uh, we pretty much have models where we uh, you know, we, we call it AI ML model, which is, uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning kind of models where we create, uh, generate nudges, which are sent to customers. Uh, you know, I, I, if, if, you, if I give you a number around 16, uh, uh, 16 million nudges is what like, you know, regularly per year, we kind of, you know, sent it to, uh, to our clients. And uh, these, these are nudges which uh, sort of nudge you to take some sort of an action. Yes, yes. So, uh, I mean, so nudges would be, for, for example, there would be a nudge that, yeah, now you're... Uh, uh, the markets are all time high, uh, you know, good time for you to invest, you know, and, and, the, and the basis for that nudge would be that, you know, we would know that there is a deposit or some investment which is going to come up for maturity, right? So that's what, like, you know, it's the right time giving a nudge to customers uh, for them to decide or relationship managers for them to have a conversation with their customers to decide on uh, at the right time to enter or exit market. So these are the things that, you know, from a bank's perspective, we use technology pretty uh, uh, in a very robust way uh, to, uh, you know, enable the front line uh, to be able to have that conversation with their clients and uh, enable clients as well to uh, take right decisions. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So just another question on technology, and I think this is something that uh, we deal with a lot of time. And, and the thing with tech investing is that it's so exciting that it's bound to, you know, uh, go absolutely at, you know, stratospheric levels, and it's bound to go through its bus cycles as well. We've seen that in the in the you know, early 90s, uh, et cetera. Then we saw that with consumer tech. A lot of the consumer tech companies that listed and then the whole path to profitability debate. So question to both of you, different aspects. Um, your advice, Ashish, to investors on this new wave, which is you know, AI, space technology, semiconductors, et cetera. What would you tell investors? How can we avoid getting our fingers burnt? And Richard, and I want your perspective as a wealth manager who's you know, helping family offices or ultra h &Is because it's the jazz is, you, know, you cannot escape it. But how do, you, how do you still be cautious? So, Ashish, you go uh, first. I'm going, to say, I'm going to say probably two things. You know, uh, Surbhi spoke about, and we're talking about AI. You know, AI is a buzzword today, yeah? But when uh, tech reaches a stage where all of us are talking about it, that's a time not to invest. Yeah. 
So you got to be, you got to work with managers, therefore, who kind of done this before, who got access to cutting edge technology, who burn their fingers and kind of learn the art in terms of how do you spot the next uh, uh, big trend or the next opportunity and, you know, work with them, right? Related point within that is, you know, a lot of family offices and individuals believe they have access to deal flow and therefore, you know, they want to work directly with startups and they say, I want to be in the cap table directly. And I think that's fundamentally, there's a problem there, you know, because if you're getting those access to those deals, those are not the best deals, right? So, you know, the work with high quality managers, take your time uh, 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 to find and build a relationship with that lot and, you know, work with your advisors to make sure you have the right uh, people and stay away from the fear of missing out. You know, there's always <laughs> the next big thing. So the FOMO will not take you anywhere. Yeah. Okay, so don't let FOMO take over all your decisions. Richard, as a wealth manager, when you talk to your team and, you know, these are ideas that most clients probably want. Uh, some some knowledge about and maybe a piece of the action as well. How do you sort of uh, handle so, this? So look, Surabhi, uh, we are a bank. Uh, and uh, as a bank, it's not just about uh, uh, the investment. Uh, investment is one part of it, right? Investing into mutual funds or AIFs and PMS is one part of it that, you know, is a part of our, uh, uh, you know, bouquet of products that we offer to our customers for them to decide, right? Uh, there is like this whole uh, banking, whole kind of holistic, we call it holistic banking and wealth solution services that we provide. Having said that, uh, you know, uh, being Asia's safest bank, uh, and uh, we are conservative, and we let the clients decide, and we provide all information and data points to our clients to decide what's the right asset allocation for them or a portfolio mix that they should be, uh, you know, uh, going for. Uh, but uh, personally, for my own wealth, I stay invested and I'm very conservative. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. You know, coming down to some final thoughts, uh, we're in an election year and, you know, the markets are vibrant, the economy is vibrant. From a regulatory perspective, when it comes to wealth management and digital technology, and te te technology uh, are there any changes that you would like to see uh, in the landscape, regulatory or government in yes. any way? Yeah, so over the, over the last couple of years, we've seen that uh, as far as wealth, uh, uh, you know, industry is concerned, uh, regulators have kind of, you know, come up with a lot of changes. Uh, and wealth, uh, you know, whether it is from a, uh, you know, regulator's point of view, SEBI point of view, even on insurance side, we've seen that there are a couple of changes. IID has come up with a with lot of changes. So it, it is an evolving, uh, you know, phase, and it's, it's a journey. It, it's, it's a journey that all of us are kind of, you know, looking at uh, uh, the changes and then kind of pivoting ourselves to see that how do we go and, uh, uh, you know, be the right partner, wealth partner to our customers. So, yes, I mean, uh, there is something which, which will keep happening. And uh, uh, we uh, anticipate that there will be further some uh, uh, changes that we see. In fact, like, you know, on a sustainable financing side, on ESG side, we expect that there might be some... Uh, uh, changes to uh, the way fund managers and selection process should happen. But let's see. I mean, I can't really uh, comment more than that. Fair yeah. enough. We'll, we'll watch the space, yeah. uh, Ashish. No, I think a uh, couple of things. You know, first, uh, you know, SEBI, uh, they've been very proactive, especially around wealth management, to uh, distinguish distribution businesses and advisory businesses. Yeah. And I think over the next few years, we will see rise of advisory businesses, right? You know, a lot of the HNIs, UHNIs, uh, family offices would want uh, someone inside, uh, someone as an advisor, uh, a close eight, to help them navigate through what the decision making is. And at the regulatory level, they need to keep an eye on making sure that the two parts, advisory and distribution, do not mix. You know, if they kind of kept independent, you know, that's how we'll see the benefit around that. The second piece is, you know, I don't have an answer for that, but, you know, if you kind of look through and talk to a lot of the family offices, the family offices are not being set up in India. You know, they're going to Singapore, they're going to Dubai. That means there's a gap, right? So that means there's a gap. And the regulator needs to figure out a way to make sure you retain the capital in India because to fuel the next level of innovation, you want domestic capital, right? You know, that's the second part. And the third thing is, which could be probably related in terms of how do you retain capital in the country, is to put incentives. You know, even you go to developed markets, right, uh, you know, UK is a great point. To angel investors, there are tax incentives. To family offices, there are reasons to kind of back uh, 
high on IP sort of an initiative. I think, you know, that's a change one would like that. And that change could be directed towards maybe climate, to ESG benefits and stuff like that. Yeah? So there are a bunch of things. I've got a longer list, but maybe another day. <laughs> Taxes, let's not even go there because I do track that in my day job. And just yesterday we were having a debate on the channel on inheritance tax and certain very interesting points Mr. Mohandas Pai was making about driving entrepreneurs away. So, well, let's hold our breath and let's just hope that doesn't happen. But on, on angel tax, which was the big headline of 2023, 24, has that settled now? No, I, I think that's settled. But I think the, the principles behind that angel tax was very simply to see that our people cleaning up their money. So, you know, the idea for a SEBI or a regulator was to make sure that every rupee behind a company, you know, was clean money, tax paid money and stuff like that. And the reason to do that from my perspective is, you know, if you, there are 100 startups out there, 90 are bound to fail, which essentially means you kind of capitalize some of the entities and, you know, there's no track in terms of where the money went, right? So, you know, but as an institutional investor, you know, we don't face that problem because, you know, you've onboarded your investors doing proper KYC, you, uh, uh, you know, follow the regulatory norms and all the compliance checks and balances, and, you know, uh, the regulator is not bothered about that. It's the other part, yeah. It's an evolving landscape, but uh, I guess a very promising one at that as well. Thank you both very much. This was a very uh, enlightening conversation, and I hope the audience enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Great conversation indeed. Thank you, thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Surubi. Before we move on, I have a few announcements to make. Actually, just one announcement, which is about uh, which is about the presence of uh, DBS Treasurer's uh, wealth managers right outside in the pre-function area. And if you have uh, any queries, any questions, or if you want to uh, brainstorm with them, they're right outside there for you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we now move on and we talk about Singapore. Yes, uh, we spoke about the nuances of wealth management in India's dynamic landscape just uh, a few minutes back, but what we are now going to look at is the Singapore experience. Insights from Singapore. Dynamic wealth management uh, uh, mantras from Singapore. So we move on and uh, we talk about our next subject, which is reimagining the future of wealth management in our context. Singapore, renowned for its cutting edge financial ecosystem and forward thinking regulatory uh, framework, serves as an inspirational hub for wealth management excellence. In the upcoming panel, what we are going to explore is uh, insights on the title New Age Wealth Management Approach with Inspirations from Singapore, and we bring together a distinguished group of experts who will share their personal experiences, perspectives, and also what are the inspirations they derive from Singapore's wealth management practices. So from leveraging uh, fintech solutions to embracing a client-centric approach, our panelists will talk about the principles and strategies that can drive transformative change in our own wealth management world. So without further ado, let me take this opportunity to invite on stage the moderator of the session, CNBC TV 18's Ritu Singh. If I can have her here, right there. And please put your hands together as I invite our panelists on stage. Sarvajit Varg, co-founder and MD, Finvasia. Vishal Rakyan, founding member and business head, EHNI, HNI, Angel One Wealth. Dr. Ritesh Malik, angel investor and founder, Innovate. And Keng Sui Ko, executive director, regional head, investment, products and advisory, DBS Bank. Over to you. Thanks, Mukta, for that introduction. Uh, well, I am, of course, going to get the Singapore angle. We have someone from DBS Bank Singapore right here. But lastly, what we'd like to touch upon is the evolution of the wealth management industry in what is a digital first world. I mean, uh, we are living in a digital first world. Perhaps 10 years ago, that wouldn't be a true statement. But, you know, technology's touched every aspect of our lives. Wealth management is no different. And I have an esteemed panel, I think quite, uh, you know, varied experiences here to bring out some of the nuances in that. So let me 
me start with you, Vishal. Uh, you know, as, as a young company, as a digital first company in the wealth management space, uh, just start by setting a context as to how big the opportunity now is, thanks to the advent of digital. Uh, you know, when we talk about a new ultra HNI getting created in India and every three days, that's a staggering figure. But how is technology aided in the expansion of the industry? Okay, so. Uh Couple of things, uh, you know, the reason we all got together and started uh, and, and building this platform is because there are few trends which are happening today. One is the rise of the uh, tier two and three, tier three cities for wealth. So how do you kind of reach out to them and create an efficient distribution model? You need technology to leverage that. Second thing that's happening is clients are increasingly, see clients have historically invested across two, three different platforms but they have a problem of consolidating that data and getting insights from that data, right? That is a, something that can be today solved completely technologically, where earlier it used to be very manual interface driven, right? So you can today actually get your entire portfolio consolidated at a click of a button and insights from that using AI can be generated right there on the spot, right? Uh, another thing where I think technology is gonna be playing a very, very big part is in the relationship management side making it hyper-personalized. So today, uh, using language learning models, you can create sort of a hyper-personalized engagement for every client. You don't have to send en masse uh, messages to clients, right? Like I think even DBS was saying, they've created nudges, right? You can create very intelligent nudges which are very client-centric. So today we can actually uh, study client behavior over his, his journey of investing and build products accordingly for the client. Right, which could have not been done earlier. Right? Using machine learning, we can actually see the client's entire investment journey if they let us and if they give us permission. And from that, ins give them insights about their own behavior at various market cycles. And then curate products accordingly. So you know, those are some of the things that and, we find uh, exciting. Sarjeet, has your experience been similar? Thank you very much. Um, I'll simply say that uh, you know, the, the the definition of wealth is actually going to change drastically in the next few years. And when I say that, I, I will probably get on to a point saying that uh, if you really break it down to the ABC, it's more on the accessibility. I know a lot of people will say AI. It is part of the accessibility. And B is taking the biasness out of the system. And third, we are moving to a more customized world. I mean, we are gone with the, with the ecosystem where it used to be like a one problem, one app solution. You know, we are giving them, uh, say, one kind of asset classes. Now, everybody wants access to their entire ecosystem, their entire wealth within the single application. I mean, the, the whole definition is, is what I was referring to, is the basics of the wealth creation the basics of having access to the wealth and even to, to do better with the money. Ultimately, you know, we spend so much time, you know, say 18 hours in a day, out of that we work so hard, and we are very sensitive to money. And when you do that, you are tend to be very cautious of where your money goes. And more importantly, how can you do better with your money? I mean, the whole ecosystem is built up uh, where the wealth creation, wealth maintenance, transfer of wealth on succession, all that is, is gonna change in the next few years. And part of it is gonna be technology, but part of it is because the demographics of India is now expecting more. And that will create the more futuristic driven technologies and most of the fintechs, if you talk about it, knows that the, the bridge has to be by creating more customized, more my problem, my app, instead of one problem solution. And that's where I think the wealth is moving. Well, lots of interesting points between the two of you, and I'll get to some of the nitty-gritties of that. But Ritesh, let me quickly get in your comments as well. I don't know if you all know, Ritesh is a doctor turned entrepreneur turned investor. So let me ask you to don that investor hat for a moment and give us a sense of where you see the intersection of angel investment and wealth management. I mean, in the previous panel, we were hearing about H&I's approach to uh, sort of angel investment. Just give us a sense of you know, how technology has shaped some of the trends that you're seeing there. Sure. First of all, uh, I'm very underdressed. I'm extremely sorry. Uh, typical young entrepreneur. But yes, first of all, 
Thank you very have much. Have to carry the look of yes. uh, fintech yes. entrepreneur, of course. So interestingly, uh, I've realized this, and Ashish would back this, as a founder, what it takes to generate wealth is opposite of what it takes to preserve wealth. And I've burnt my fingers over there. And uh, I think angel investing as an asset class is getting bigger and bigger. Uh, when I started angel investing, this was 2013, when I was in my final year, I, I was working at Gangaram Hospital. I think there were hardly 10 to 15 angel investors. And today we have 2,800 people who mention angel investor in their LinkedIn profile. So I think as an industry it's growing, in my opinion, I tell everyone, have at least 2% of your wealth parked in startups. I, I, I genuinely believe the next wave of technological products will come from Bharat. They will not only solve challenges of Bharat, but will be built for the world. I truly believe that there will be, uh, uh, th we have so many challenges and the kind of R&D which will happen. And, and these are phases, like in America we saw, it took them 50 years to where they are today. But India has leapfrogged. We have 83.5 crore people online. We're the largest digital democracy and open internet ecosystem. I, I think I'm very bullish on angel investing. And uh, uh, lastly, on investing, I think never ever, your first check should never be yourself. Hmm. Use. Uh, either as a family office, always invest in a fund. Uh, it's, it's, it's very easy to invest and, and angel investing is very hard. You will, 99% you'll never get your money back if you invest yourself. So I think uh, go with a fund, hmm. uh, go with GrowX, go with any fund that you like, but yeah. go with a fund and <laughs> then learn and, 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 and start small. Uh, I know a family office, they invested 50 crore rupees 2015 in five startups, hmm. all five tanked. Do not do those kind of adventure, <laughs> or uh, it's, it's actually risky. Well, I, I, you're, you're confusing us. You're very bullish in the startup ecosystem. You're telling us at least 2% of your wealth should be in the startup space. And then you're giving us an example of a family that lost don't, all don't their money. Don't do it directly. <laughs> when okay. you start, Go start wealth small. Managers. And, okay. and also start small. Uh, a a okay. lot of people just uh, with, the, with the entire hype by media, hmm. they just think that we're going to invest and we are going to just make a 10x return. That does not happen most of the times. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll hold my comments on the media, but Ken, just uh, quickly, is that something you hear from your clients as well? Are they very bullish about investing in uh, the startup ecosystem? And generally at DBS, uh, coming from Singapore, give us your, uh, you know, your own experience there, what the trends that you're seeing in the digital space, uh, the investment themes that are playing out, just uh, your first thoughts to kick things off. Right, so um, hi everyone, good evening. Um, so first of all, uh, it's great to be back in Delhi. I was last year 10 years ago. Uh, a lot has changed. Uh, but I think one thing remains the same, and that is uh, Indians' love for investment and wealth management. And that I know because I watched CNBC in my hotel room. <laughs> and it was full of stock tips and what's happening with the Nifty. And I guess uh, I'm coming at a good time because the stock market is at, a, at an all-time high. Um, so to your question about uh, what do Singaporeans invest in, I think there's still a lot of interest in the public markets, um, especially with what's happened over the last 12 months. So people were a little spooked after 2022 when markets corrected, but since then markets have rallied, uh, even in the US, in Japan, in India. Hong Kong, China is a bit down, but that's recovering. So, so a lot of people are still investing in the public markets, but uh, we're starting to see more interest uh, in private funds, private equity, private debt, especially in the ultra high net worth space. So that's something that we're, we're promoting. Uh, I think the title of today's uh, uh, event really is about inspirations from Singapore. So I thought maybe I could just talk a bit about that. Yeah, right? Sure. So, yeah, since I'm from Singapore and that's kind of something that, you know, uh, is, is people, what people are interested in. Um, so, I think what's really happening in Singapore is that over the last few years, and particularly after COVID, uh, Singapore has really risen in stature as a financial hub. And uh, a lot of uh, millionaires and billionaires have moved uh, their assets into Singapore. Um, and that's why uh, we've also seen uh, an increase in family offices, of which DBS Singapore is managing a large uh, part of it. Uh, we think that uh, that trend is set to continue. Uh, trust, as mentioned many times in the past, uh, that 
is a very important component of what we offer in DBS Singapore. And I think one point that I actually haven't heard in the last few presentations was diversification, uh, which is very important. Uh, because when markets are rallying, it's easy to get caught, caught up, especially in the technology stocks, in the cryptocurrencies, because the more you make, the more you want to buy the same stock. You want to buy the Nvidia, you want to buy the Tesla, you want to buy the Bitcoin. But when markets correct, they correct in a very, very severe way. So it's very important that we have diversification, portfolio diversification, and which is what we do across the wealth continuum in DBS, which is to engage clients on their portfolio needs, find out what exactly are they looking for, what is their risk to tolerance, and make sure that they're invested across stocks, bonds, fixed income, private assets, so that they're not narrowly focused. I think that's one very important tenet in wealth management. Okay, diversification is the key to uh, investments, and that's something that you as wealth management uh, you know, in, in Singapore would be advocating. But if you were to look and compare the India market with where Singapore is at right now, uh, what emerges as the key differences and areas where India could learn perhaps from what you've done at Singapore? Right, so I actually cover the, the entire region in, in Singapore. So I do see beyond just Singapore and India. I also see Hong Kong, China, Indonesia, Thailand. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's really quite interesting because um, in the smaller markets, uh, we do see a lot more um, international assets on top of uh, the home market. But in the larger economies like India and China, we see a lot of bias uh, towards domestic assets. Okay. Um, because of the regulatory restrictions in India, mm. banks can only offer a very limited uh, range of uh, products. Uh, so right now, you need trust and AIF and what have you. Um, so I think you know, with uh, the deregulation that I hear that's coming, hopefully there can be more uh, uh, development and more in innovation uh, in product development. There's also all the developments in Give City as well that uh, would serve also to be a uh, location where product innovation can take place. All right, I'm going to uh, zoom in from the global uh, you know, experience to the very micro experience. And, you know, Vishal, you started by talking about how thanks to uh, technology, uh, you know, you're, you're not just catering to the tier one, to the metros and, and, and you know, people, individuals there. Uh, just give us in terms of data, for instance, your new set of customers, uh, where you're seeing this industry sort of grow in tier two, beyond tier three and four, where you're seeing more demand. And if digital really has helped you expand that target uh, client base, to what extent? Uh, so giving you some data points. So for example, if you look at the Indian mutual fund industry, it's classified as T30 and then B30. T30 is the top 30 and mm. B30 is beyond the top 30. In the last two years, the market share of the B30 has actually gone up by 2%. And these are last two years with the dramatic inflows in mutual funds. Mm. And that has come through fintech players. Today, the top three fintech players in the country manage 46% of active client user base in the stock market, mm. right? Which was, and these three players actually run only digital models. They don't even run omni channels like what we are building in wealth, mm. right? So, so that is a big thing. Another thing, if you, I mean, if you just look at data, right, today, like uh, you mentioned, and I think IPS, I'm just addressing his point. Creating an investment policy statement is very, very important. Traditionally, it's only done by wealth managers when they go and visit clients. So that yeah. access is only given to the ultra h &Is, Yeah. Right? Using technology, you can democratize that. You can provide that access to h &Is, affluent uh, clients, and everybody can have their investment policy statement, which tells them, basis their risk, return, and time horizon what is the asset classes they should be in and how much. And they can even control it and monitor it digitally. Hmm. So that nobody is, you know, most of the people, like somebody used the word FOMO, somebody, you know, most of the people buy because there's something in the news and they don't realize how that's impacting their overall portfolio. Hmm. Right? Like you mentioned very clearly that you should have 2%. So somebody should help people define. And that's when the experience with investing will get good. Hmm. And you can use that through technology, you can do that and you can create it for the HNIs, the emerging HNIs, and not only restricted to the ultra HNIs. Hmm. Right? So I think that is where a big role, and today India has 760 million internet users. Yeah. 500 million of them actually are non English internet users, hmm. which means you can create vernacular investments hmm. using technology, which is very difficult to do if you. So my first job ever was in a startup hmm. in Bombay, and we used to cater to uh, a lot of regional players. So we used to hire, we have to hire people who spoke, spoke regional languages 
hmm. to cater to regional markets. Yeah. Technology can help you solve that problem. So, you know, a lot of things that technology will sol solve over the next coming few years. Sarvajit, would you uh, be able to help us with where you're seeing these emerging hotspots of opportunities for you outside of the Delhi's and Mumbai's and Bangalore's of the world? Sure. Um, I think uh, from, you know, coming from a fintech mindset, uh, I, I strongly say a, a line that once data st talks to data, we all will get to know what we don't know. And that's where, you know, the whole shift will ultimately move into, right? I mean, it's not going to be far, and obviously one of our disruption products which we are working on right now is that can you really talk to your data? Can you really ask a question about your financial health? Can you understand what your actual bank statement says? Can you, and again, when you're talking about that, you know, that next level of accessibility, I think the AI and LLM models can really create those vernacular languages where people say, Mujhe mere finance ke mein batao. I'm sorry, I'm just, you know, for some people who can't get it, I'm saying that, please tell me more about my finances, right? I mean, if this is how the simple accessibility can be given to tier two, tier three city, mm. think about how the wealth will multiply over years, right? And this is where I believe that most of the shift, including ourselves, is more looking at tier two, three or three cities where people have wealth. I mean, we have seen the work from home culture. We have seen how massive infra real estate has been building up in tier two, three cities because people really need those, you know, those accessibilities, those comforts. Mm -hmm. And that will again come from when you have a wealth, how do you multiply it? How do you better? Mm -hmm. And these technology tools, I strongly believe that will give that power to the users mm -hmm. where they will simply go and ask a generative AI in you know, their local language is saying, help me. Mm -hmm. And trust me, there are going to be answers on their own wealth, on their own personal finances, and that will make them do better. You said there's power in the hands of users, right? And thanks to people like you that are building platforms that are so easy to use. And my question to you is, how do you differentiate as a business, if it's that easy for me to download and use an app, uh, you know, switch from one platform to another where maybe I get a, get a, have to pay a lower fees, for instance, how do you differentiate yourself? And is customer loyalty becoming a challenge for the industry? So I think it's not about cost anymore. Let me be very honest to you. And it's, it's for everybody. Ultimately, it's a value. Mm. Now, how, does, how do you define a value, right? I mean, for someone who is earning, say, you know, one lakh rupee a month, their aspirations, their vision to do certain things are going to be very different, right? I mean, and similarly, once you start moving to a higher segment, HNIs, ultra HNIs, mm. you know, they have built those assets over a period of time, and they have gone through a lot of circles. Mm. Now, how typically it, it happens is, you know, from a technology standpoint, it's very easy to say we can copy you. Trust me, it's not that easy, right? I mean, it's, if that would have been a case, everybody would just copy. I mean, those were the days we could just pick up an idea from a US and saying, you know, white label it, give it back to the Indian clients, everybody will be happy. It doesn't work that way. I mean, yeah. you know, the value proposition will again come from the customization. You know, the whole ABC where I started, yeah. when you start giving what the actual user wants, hmm. and they get it, sure. trust me, they don't want to go anywhere else. Well, um, I keep hearing the words customization, personalization, hyper-personalization. Uh, you know, what for, for you at DBS, for instance, what has been your own sort of experience? We're talking about this use of digital hyper-personalization. Um, when you're looking to scale uh, these solutions, does that become a challenge at some level? Um, no, actually, I think it becomes simpler because um, with technology, you're actually able to personalize even more easily. Mm. In the past, for example, for us to be able to create something that's bespoke for clients, they needed to have, say, $10 million for us to create a portfolio for the clients. But right now, uh, even if you have as little as $1,000, we're able to create a portfolio for you by tapping on technology. And we use what we call uh, robo-advisory in the bank. Right? and which we've also launched in DBS India. So that started in Singapore, uh, where we are able to, based on the market views, uh, our house view, our CIO view, then create a portfolio of UTs, uh, six to eight unit trusts. And in the past, every single unit trust might require you to put 10,000 US dollars. But because of the power of technology, 
and the ability for us to aggregate across clients. So now, with li as little in Singapore, as little as 1,000 US dollars, you're able to invest into a portfolio of diversified funds, from equity to bond to balance. So that, to me, in, in a sense, is also an example of personalization because you are able to actually pick from a range of portfolio, whatever suits you, which is not something that you could do in the past. Well, uh, I also want to touch upon the aspect of this digital versus physical, yeah. um, especially in a market like India, for instance. You know, there, there are various generations of users, there are various age groups of users. Not everybody may be as tech savvy as the other. How do you solve for that, Ritesh, for instance? I mean, it, can, can we envisage a future where wealth management could be completely digital? Uh, what is the ideal mix? Sure, so I think uh, the digital trust in India has leap forward. If you see uh, earlier, at least 10 years back, people would not even transfer money to their accounts because they would say that wo paisa koi chura ke le jayega. So we are seeing a very, very uh, interesting digital leap forwarding happening in our country. Uh, I'll tell you something very interesting. There's an app. Uh, when you talk about tier two cities, yeah. there are young children who are actually building their mock stock portfolios. Aspirations of India have changed drastically. We no longer want FD returns because of people like Angur Variko and all the influencers of, of the country. We, we've started to understand and the challenge is our education system has never taught us personal finance. And for the first time, because of YouTube, we are actually learning what is compounding. We are actually learning what is inflation. We are actually earning what, how do you not make money doing an FD? So I think this digital trust is actually helping. So I'm 34 right now, and I got money when I was 29. And I genuinely did not know what to do with the money. And I started talking to a lot of uh, investment banking uh, people. And I, I, I was actually, because the only thing that I knew was startups, so I said, okay, I'm going to invest majority of my capital in startups. And then someone told me that you don't do that. You have to actually have a very, as, as he rightly said, have a very diversified portfolio. So yeah. I think information and democracy is extremely important. I genuinely feel that platforms like what both of you are building are going to truly democratize. And when it comes to AI, uh, we are actually contemplating of investing in a YC company that is building AI nudges. Someone just used the word nudge. Mm. Nudges are going to transform the world of wealth management. Uh, example, uh, I was just speaking to Ritesh, uh, the other Ritesh from Oyo, and this was uh, 2020, and, and uh, I just asked him where to invest capital. He said, the Nifty is at an all-time low, invest in the Nifty. I said, I'm very scared. He said, in all the collapses of uh, stock markets in the world in the history, it has always rebound to go higher. We are all paid to predict the future, all of us. All of us are paid. It, uh, CNBC predicts the future like, like anything. In, uh, you, you are continuously, and I use CNBC. <laughs> no, of course. So, so see. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, we, we let our guests do the talking. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the panelists as well. Yeah. So uh, I gen uh, we are all, by the end of the day, most of the people in the room, the better you predict the future, the more wealthier you will become. Hmm. So uh, they are using AI to genuinely see history points in a particular stock and predict what is going to happen and we are not even we have not even scratched the surface of ai in wealth management we are going to see platforms mm. that can predict how a stock will do with an accuracy of 96 to 97% well data is empowering and it, it it's good to hear that but let me pose that question to you then uh, all of this data all of this information is it easy to disseminate to or, or rather, my question, I'll come back to what I did not get from Ritesh, was the physical versus digital aspect of it. Uh, you know, do you find it challenging, perhaps, uh, to sort of use this tool with all age groups, with all segments of uh, your clients, or how are you approaching it? So, I, I, our belief internally is that HNI and the ultra HNI segment, at least for the next five, seven years, hmm. will be served through an omni channel. Yeah. where you are empowering your relationship managers, wealth managers with a lot of data and insights about their customers and about the markets and about the products. Hmm. What, what currently is happening is where maybe a wealth manager has their own views which they share which might not be necessarily the organization views, that will change. The views, the analysis, the data will be done through technology. 
The product curation will be done through technology. Relationship managers' main uh, job would be to engage with clients, understand them better, and there also we will provide them a lot of nudges in mm. terms of the behavior of the client from his past transactions, mm. right? So, so those things we firmly believe will be an omni-channel. However, when you mentioned our parent company uh, is, is a fully uh, digital company. Traditional. Uh, is a fully <laughs> digital company. And uh, they, and the stat that's re revealing is 70% of fintech wealth users are mm. actually either millennials or gen, gen, gen X. Z, yeah. So which, which basically means that going forward, digital is going to become the way, I mean, we believe it's going to be omni-channel for a while, hmm. but again, not trying to predict the future. How long <laughs> is that while? We don't predict, so we're going to ask you, how, how long is that while? We, we don't see it happening for at least the next five, seven years for sure. All right. Uh, and, and, you know, again, like you said, I'm putting money in a digital channel. Paisa kahan ja hai? That concern about, uh, you know, when you deal with digital, uh, you know, your Sarvajit, data privacy, data security, how are you able to bring that comfort to your clients that I'm using these tools, your data is secure? Uh, you know, give us some examples, real world examples. So I think um, fortunately we are in India and we are very regulated. Hmm. So let's take that as a compliment. And that, I'll, so that's, that's more important. You know, how the whole digital transformation, financial inclusion, you know, these words are becoming normal for us and how that actually is happening, we can't even predict because tier two, tier three, tier four cities, hmm. they have become so used to with tech hmm. that asking them to stay away from mobile. I mean, my father does more shopping on you know, <laughs> digital platforms than me, but that's the shift what we are talking about. Hmm. I think within the regulated space, it becomes also important for the stakeholders, which are like us, you know, mm. so we are in fintech, but we are also, you know, regulated by SEBI and RBI, mm. which creates that ecosystem that as you are maturing, as you are building these products, your sense of responsibility is not just towards regulators, but also towards clients. Mm. Because people are trusting you, right? As I said, the, even if the custody remains with the bank, the experience, the transaction, the security, is on the fintech applications. And this is where I believe that a lot of regulated compliances, a lot of audits, a lot of, uh, you know, VPAT, uh, PSID, I think these, these tech audits are creating a lot of confidence for companies like us because then you can think of innovation, right? You don't have to go out and saying, hmm. I need to, you know, convince a client that my mobile app is safe. Yeah. Because you know consciously it is and being regulated, yeah. It also gives you comfort. So on, on the, the tech side. Within those guardrails. Within those guardrails. But yeah. yes, as you tend to innovate, mm -hmm. obviously people's expectations are going high. Yeah. Data is very critical and needs to be saved the most, right? I mean, yeah. it's more of you're walking into a mall and think about there are CCTV cameras who have a cognitive behavioral AI tools at the back end, right? Yeah. So they know exactly when you're walking into a mall, which store you're gonna go, yeah. what are you gonna buy? Yeah. That cognitive side of behavior yeah. analysis, again, is gonna give, create more customized solutions where the privacy and security becomes more critical. Well, it's refreshing to hear a FinTech founder thanking the Reserve Bank of India for a change, for putting those guardrails into place, because it's often the other side. We hear that, you know, the regulations are stifling innovation, but of course, it is to protect customers. Just quick final thoughts, King. Uh, you know, how do you envisage the future of wealth management in this age of digitization, hyper-personalization, and the democratization of data, which is also raising up the client's expectations? Um, actually, I don't think you'll be fully digital, mm. right? Um, because I think we've gone through waves uh, over the last 10 years. Um, and every time when the market corrects, that's when you really need that human element and dimension to come in. I wouldn't say it's 100% human, but I wouldn't say it's 100% digital. So it's somewhere in between, mm -hmm. right? Depending on which stage or which part of the wealth continuum you're at. Um, so, so I think Richard mentioned earlier that uh, we have this term that we use in DBS that we say digital, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's kind of like our all-encompassing way to say that, look, it's not going to be either extreme. 
Um, I think the future is bright. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot more innovation that's coming up, you know, not just in um, robo-advisory, AIML, uh, even, you know, in new products and all. Uh, in Singapore recently, uh, we even, you know, ventured into blockchain and, you know, started to put cryptocurrencies onto our digi digital platforms and all that, uh, while at the same time also, you know, ensuring that there are guardrails and that people get the information that they need. Because I think earlier on, there was that question about uh, what about the data? And yeah. will clients get the data, the RMs get the data that they need? I think what people need right now is insights, mm -hmm. not information. Because I don't think there is a shortage of information. Yeah, there I think is there is a glut, yeah. right? So the, the, the whole point is to turn that into insights yeah. and the financial institution, the fintech that's able to do that, I think will be the one who wins yeah. the market share. I, I think there's way too much data out there, but yes, <laughs> insights is what you want, some deductions to make from that data. Ritesh, you have the final word. Uh, what are some of the emerging themes and technologies in this space that excite you most about how this wealth management uh, you know, ecosystem itself is shaping up? I think when it comes to AI, uh, I genuinely feel AI has not even scratched the surface when it comes to wealth management mm. and cybersecurity. These are two trends I'm seeing. Uh, example, there's a, one of the most famous platforms in the country today gets attacked by cyber uh, crime almost every three hours. Yeah. We need to ensure data... Unfortunately, in India, we do not care about data. At least majority of our country does not. And I think that is one of the largest opportunities that entrepreneurs have. All right. Uh, on that and, note... And one last piece. I completely agree with you. When it comes to... Uh, I don't think it will ever go only digital. It will yeah. always be digital. As long as there is greed and fear in the markets, you will need a human trust to actually console, solace, and give you confidence when markets tank. All right. Uh, on that note, unfortunately, we've run out of time. So hopefully, we'll continue this conversation outside. But Vishal, Sarvajit, uh, Ritesh, and Keng, thank you very much for candidly sharing your thoughts on the matter. And I hope it was an insightful conversation for everyone in the audience. Thank you very much for listening patiently. Thank you. Thank you all for that very candid and insightful session. Now to draw the Delhi chapter of the DBS Treasures Annual Wealth Summit to a close, I would like to invite on stage Bharat Mani, Managing Director and Head National Distribution, DBS Bank India to deliver the vote of thanks. Thanks a lot, Mukta, and what a fascinating evening it has been over the last hour, hour and a half, and I'm sure uh, all of you in the room would agree uh, that the debates that we heard today from the panel and the discussions which we had with the panel, uh, and of course, starting off with the keynote address done by Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal, who took us through the ages of back into the, uh, uh, you know, in a way back into the future, to borrow from the movie, where we saw India's role in the global economy uh, from a peak coming down to a trough, and then uh, hopefully in the next uh, near future, we take the podium as one of the uh, top three economies in the world. Um, that was a fascinating insight. I need to thank Sanj Mr. Sanyal for uh, being here with us, sharing his insights uh, from a macro standpoint, also bringing in the world economy into view and our, our own country's pedestal. I'm sure each one of us will be proud of seeing India on the top of the pedestal. We then went on uh, to a very interesting panel, uh, you know, where we had in the first panel my colleague uh, Richa and Ashish, who gave us some very, very interesting insights into what we are seeing as an emerging uh, trend uh, on the wealth management space, specifically also bolstering what uh, Mr. Sanyal said earlier, uh, and specific to the India context. Wealth is here to stay, growing wealth has always been part of human psyche, but then the acceptance of uh, 
uh, a broader variety of investors into new age technological in innovations, catching it early, angel investing, uh, to do or not to do angel investing always continues to be a debate. How to do it was partially touched on by the second panel, but I would like to thank Ashish and Richa for having shared their insights uh, as a part of that discussion. And finally, the uh, final panel uh, took us through a range of uh, discussions, right? Right from fintech, non-fintech, digital, not digital, should we have RM, should we go digital, should we use AI, should we rely on AI, what is the future? I think, uh, you know, the, the debate continues, and we'll have to see how that pans on. But a very, very interesting facet of discussions which was uh, taken up. And I sincerely want to thank Sarvajit, uh, Vishal, Ritesh, Kengsui from our uh, DBS team uh, as we go along. But having said that, um, I also will be remiss uh, if uh, I don't point out that the reason that we, we wanted to bring this particular wealth management summit to you from DBS and co-powered by uh, CNBC was to also uh, point out that as we take away from all the panel discussions that we have, each one of us in this room and viewers watching this uh, telecast would uh, want to take insights on where should they invest, how should they invest, is digital right, is digital right. I just wanted to point out that we from DBS attempt to address all these uh, and, and go through and channelize all these queries and attempt to invest and ensure that as the world's uh, best bank rated by a few accredited institutions and as Asia's safest bank over multiple years, we'll try and t ensure that we advise or rather ensure that we give you the right kind of insights as rightly pointed out in a world of over information uh, through our team of treasurers relationship managers. We are digital in India. Uh, we've got, as Prashant had said earlier, we are present in 350 cities with 525 branches. So you want to go digital, we have digital. You want to walk in and meet our people, we are digital. Uh, and I want to ensure that I thank each and every, of, every one of you in this room. Some of our uh, ultra high net worth customers present here for banking with us and reposing trust in us and seeing uh, your wealth grow. And those of you who don't bank with us, I would urge you to bank with us and try us out uh, as well uh, to test out some of these hypotheses. Uh, last but not the least, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you to uh, Surabhi, Ritu, and Mukda for having uh, uh, hosted this event, heralded these discussions, asking those in questions which at times poked us and at times brought out the insights. And uh, thanks Hyatt Regency for hosting this entire uh, uh, physical event out here. So thank you everyone and you've been a lovely audience. A huge amount of thanks to you and a round of applause to all of you and our panelists as well. Thank you so much. Bharat wonderfully summarized there. Thank you so much. And on behalf of CNBC, I thank, of course, all our, uh, all our speakers, all our experts, and all of you for being such a wonderful audience. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we conclude DBS Treasures Annual Wealth Summit, Delhi Chapter, powered by CNBCTV18.com. And once again, a big thank you to our partners and sponsors, and of course, for, to all of you for being such a lovely audience. Thank you so much.